I have spoken here at GW many, many times, but I have to confess to you that never in this room, in fact, I didn't even know it existed uh, until this afternoon, but we'll do the best we can. <coughs> Um, I am not an expert on the publishing business, so I don't want to mislead any of you. I am an expert only on my experience with the publishing business, and I'd be happy to um, sort of split my time between that experience and to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing right now for uh, Brookings and for Valentina Kalka, who is the publisher at Brookings, and it is my pleasure uh, to be able to have that kind of intelligent person serving as publisher. My first book came out in 1958. It's the first of 14 books. It was called Eastern Exposure. And I remember that Chow Roberts, who was the diplomatic correspondent for the Washington Post, uh, did a review for it. I was thrilled that, that he would read the book and write a review and I remember the lead, which was, the only thing wrong with this book is its title, which would have you believe that it's about architecture. And it isn't. It's about, and then he went into this uh, description of the book as relatively young American serving uh, in Moscow, capital of a country that I had been uh, studying for most of my adult life up to that point, and I was teaching Russian history at um, Harvard. I don't want to overstate that. I was very much a section man for Professor Michael Karpovich, but I did spend a great deal of my time trying to understand what was going on in Russia, and that was in the, the period immediately following Stalin's death in 1953. This was 1956, part of 57. I had spent in Moscow. Um, I was working on a PhD at that time about a man named Sergei Semyonovich Uvarov. None of you I know knows anything about Sergei Semyonovich Uvarov. But you know about Putin, and Putin knows about the basis of conservative political thinking in Russian history. And Uvarov was the father of that conservative philosophy. And so you're getting it, whether you like it or not, though indirectly. And I was working on this dissertation, and I was keeping a diary. It was an accident. Um, I, I was a good boy and writing home to my parents. And my brother, who was a New York Times correspondent then, visited me in Moscow and read some of the the copy that I had, and he said, this is sort of interesting. And it surprised me because my brother never said anything that <laughs> complimentary about anything I had done. He said, really, I think it's interesting and you want to try to publish it. It was nothing more than my um, observations about Russia, um, my experiences in talking, I spoke reasonably good Russian then, and speaking with Russians. Uh, we were at that time just after something called the secret speech of Nikita Khrushchev at the 20th Party Congress in February of 56, which totally transformed the Soviet Union from a state where people were constantly living in fear to a state which was beginning to open up. And one of the students uh, at that period of time when I was working at the Lenin Library was a man named Mikhail Gorbachev. And Gorbachev was picking up this post-anti-Stalin um, talk, and he realized that communism could be successful, but only if it was totally transformed. And by chance, he became the leader, did things like perestroika and glasnost, which led ultimately to the collapse of the Soviet system. But in those days, it was new, I guess relatively exciting. We were at the height of the Cold War, and um, a man named Peter Strauss, at Farrar Strauss and Cudahy, or I think there was a third name that different from Cudahy in those days, but um, a friend of mine, actually Bernie's friend, my brother's friend, 
gave several of these letters to Peter. He read them. When I came home uh, at Christmas time, he invited me to his home. He did that three times. We had wonderful conversations. I felt I was meeting not a publisher, but a new friend. And he introduced me to other people. And the experience I had in those days was warm and encouraging and enlightening, I hope, on both sides. My ability to express what I thought was happening in the Soviet Union and people's interest in that story. So it was a book and it was called Eastern Exposure. Over the next couple of years, I remember something that Eric Sevrad, who was a colleague of mine at CBS, said to me um, once after a broadcast. He said, you've now finished something that ran for about a minute 20. No one is going to remember what you said. No one. The only way they'll remember anything is if you write it down. And if you write it down, and in an interesting way, and put it into book form, that is when people will follow what it is that is running through your head. And I never forgot that, and I made it my business at all times through a rather busy career as a broadcaster, always to write books. And most of them had to do with, with Russia or Vietnam, which became an obsession for me in the 60s and early 70s. And somewhere in the early 70s, I met, uh, again through a friend, a man named Larned Bradshaw, who was the number one publisher at Little Brown. And we were, I think I had done a talk up at Harvard, I'm not, I don't remember that exactly. But I was up there and we met. And we began to talk, and naturally in those days, conversation flowed to Henry Kissinger. And he knew that I was covering Kissinger and he knew that I had known Kissinger from an earlier time. And he said, how would you like to do a book on it? Well, this was about the sixth down the pike, and I said, covering Kissinger is incredibly time-consuming. It is very difficult, and you're often on the road. So I don't know when I can give you a manuscript. That, too, takes a lot of time. And he said, do the best you can, and uh, he signed me up to do that book. I knew I couldn't do it alone. I asked my brother to join me, and he did, and we had a really marvelous time producing uh, the book, which was, I think, in my own career, the big bestseller. Um, there was the Book of the Month Club in those days. I don't know if it still exists. Does it still exist? Does it? But now I don't know anything about it, but in those days it was a big deal. And uh, so we were the Book of the Month Club and the lead review in the Times. And it was, it was great fun being a success. We made a lot of money. And um, I remember at the very beginning when the book came out, Little Brown did a, a party at the Madison Hotel here. And Kissinger arrived. You couldn't keep him away from a television camera. And uh, so, of course, all of the reporters gathered around him immediately and asked whether he had read the book, which was called Kissinger, unimaginative book. And he said, no, I have not read the book, but I love the title. <laughs> and of course, it, it was what Kissinger wanted, which was good and very positive copy. And we loved it, because it was great for sales. In all of my experience, more or less up to that point, I was always associated with a publisher. Not an editor so much, although they came along in the process, but it was a publisher, and it was a personal relationship. It was a human being to another human being. We struck a deal, yes, and there were lawyers, yes, but they were almost irrelevant to the central process which was a personal deal 
between a publisher and a writer. And the writer, in this case I can speak only of myself, always knew that he could pick up the phone and call the publisher and share an experience of, an, of um, a substantive nature, but also share a problem which might delay a manuscript, which is personal, where you felt you were talking to a friend. That went right through uh, the Kissinger book, and we're now in the mid-1970s. By the time we got into the 1980s, and clearly in the 1990s, when I had left broadcasting and went up to Harvard in 1987, my interests and my vision, my activity, all of that changed. My world changed. And I began to think about uh, university press, and I began to think about places like Brookings, but I really didn't know Brookings terribly well then, but a, a publishing house that is sort of academic, but has half a foot anyway in the commercial world. And if you are spoiled as I was, and thinking that every book is something that makes a great deal of money, uh, I changed very quickly, starting in the 80s, into realizing that as a writer, my responsibility was in another direction. I felt truly privileged to be able to have an idea that might be of importance and even value to a student or a graduate student. And my profit came in my awareness that ideas were being transmitted to people at a university. Um, I was honored to be able to do several books um, in that vein. There was one that I did for the University of Chicago in the mid-1990s uh, called the Nixon Memo, which to this day I am incredibly proud of. I think it's one of the best things I've ever written. And it introduced me to another style, which was rather than take a large subject and try to compress it into a readable form, take a small piece of something, look through the smallest hole at an event, and use that event to elaborate a larger story. And with the Nixon memo, it was something that I just spotted. I was out in Washington. Nixon was, you know, Nixon, after he left office in 74, had another life, which was to recreate another Nixon. <laughs> and he had a great deal to work with. He was a very smart man, though nutty as can be, but incredibly smart, very experienced. And he believed that what he had was essential, not only to all of the American people in the world, but specifically to every president. And he, he decided that he was going to take this young greenhorn from Arkansas in 1993 and make him understand Nixon's vision of U.S.-Russian relations. And he sent a memo secretly, that's the world in which he lived, to Clinton. And he said, this is what you're supposed to do. And then he had a concluding paragraph. It was a one page about it. Concluding paragraph, very small, very precise, lawyer-like. <clears throat> If you do not accept my advice, <clears throat> I want you to know that I think it of such importance that it is apt to find its way into the public domain. <laughs> Translation, you buy it, we keep it quiet, just between the two of us. You don't buy it, it ends up being leaked to the New York Times as Richard Nixon tried to help you 
and you turned it down. You fool. <laughs> that memo was so illustrative, you know, the small thing, of the man, of what he was up to, what he was trying to do, not only pre this moment, but even post. Um, I was so delighted that, I forgot the guy's name now, the University of Chicago, he had a name sort of like a Polish sounding name, but a very nice man, and uh, through a friend again, I called him, would you be interested? Yes. And that was the deal. There was no money in it, but it was tremendous when it showed up on, on reading lists. And um, come into the 21st century, and I am now in Washington and associated with not only GW, but also with Brookings, and um, they came to me and asked for a book. I came to them and proposed a book, and so we've had a wonderful relationship. And now I live in a totally different world, as I was telling Toby earlier. Um, I am totally dependent on the publisher um, to sell books, to put them on the internet, to do everything that is required today that I don't know or understand. I am, as a writer, totally in your hands. And I have to trust you to do the right thing. And since I assume that you and I share one common interest, and that is to make the book as successful in terms of sales as possible, we live with each other. Um, at the moment, uh, Valentina is a wonderful person with whom to live, so I have no problem with that whatsoever. And in the remaining time that I have, and perhaps you'll have a question, I don't know, but very briefly, let me tell you um, where I am now in terms of, of book writing. I was happily in the middle of a book, not in the middle, about a third of the way into a book, on what I think is a personalized history of the Cold War. I happened through chance, no scheming on my part, chance to have been in Moscow immediately after Stalin died, to have been there when Khrushchev did his secret speech, to have been in Moscow during the Berlin crises, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, to have been in the Vietnam War, covering that war again, a major part of the East-West struggle, um, a, a story about the attempt to kill Pope John Paul II, which I still think is an essential story, which is one of the great mysteries of the 20th century. But what it is that we know is not the whole story by any stretch of the imagination. But I want to deal with that, and then I want to deal with the way in which Solidarity Poland was celebrating, by the way, this week the 25th anniversary of the collapse of communism because of the solidarity movement in Poland and the end of communism in December 1991. That was, that was my book, and as I said, it was um, not a book about me, but it, because I happened to have been there and seen things and talked to people, um, even having, a, I think, a remarkable relationship with Nikita Khrushchev, it would have been interesting. In the middle of it all, uh, Valentina and I at, at lunch, she says, uh, and this was just when the Ukraine story began to break, and she said, do you think you'd be capable of doing a short book, a little, uh, 30,000 words? Um, on this whole Cuban, uh, uh, <laughs> this whole Ukrainian mess, and what it says about U.S.-Russian relations, what it says about Putin, what kind of man he is. And I say, I've got to think about that one because I'm really loving what I'm doing. And she said, well, you know, call me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Take as much time as you like, call me tomorrow. And I, I did and thought about it, and of course I couldn't say no. And, and so I am now 
um, a third of the way, I think, uh, into a three-part book. The first part, how did this problem begin? What, why is there a Ukrainian problem now? The second part, which I am now in the middle of writing, is a, a history of Ukrainian-Russian relations and why it is that Ukraine, which has been around more or less for more than a thousand years, has been free and more or less independent for only 23 of those years. Now, if you are a 23-year-old in Kiev, you are likely to think of Ukraine as a country, as your country. I was born here, but your parents may not think that at all. Your parents are likely to speak Russian as easily as Ukrainian, are apt not to think about the border between Ukraine and Russia as a national border that you fight over. It is a border that has been porous deliberately for a thousand years. And that is because at the very beginning of this thousand year period, for 300 years, there was only what was called Kievan, Kievan Rus, um, which was a sort of country around Kiev which lived essentially on trade with Constantinople to the south, Novgorod and the, and the um, Scandinavian countries to the north. And for that 300-year period, it was a functioning, relatively prosperous piece of territory. There were no borders. And when the Mongols came in in the 13th century, they simply leveled here and ended its civilization. Other Slavs, however, leaving Kiev, went northeast to a very small town called Moscow. And that very small town did, began to develop. And then you had Ivan III and the Fourth, the Terrible, people like that until you got to Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. All of them looked upon Ukraine as um, a cousin, not, not a vassal, but a cousin, a member of the family, off to one side doing his or her thing, but certainly not a country. And so when Putin told President Bush at a meeting in Bucharest in 2008, Mr. President, you have to realize that Ukraine is not really a country. That's what he meant as a Russian nationalist. It isn't a country. Foreign Minister Lavrov, rather sophisticated man, Lavrov is not as blunt as uh, Putin, and he made a talk the other day, last week, in which he put it in a historical context, and he was accurate. He said, Kiev is the first Russian city. He didn't bombastically claim Moscow was the great of Petersburg. No. Kiev is the first Russian city. Ukraine, which in Russian means um, something on the rim, something on the edge, borderland, off to the side anyway. Um, Ukraine was never a concept until the middle of the 19th century. So what I'm trying to explain in this middle of the book is um, try not to think, try to understand a Russian perspective on what is happening in Ukraine today and not to think about Putin as Adolf Hitler and the beginning of uh, a new Cold War because it isn't that at all. And the last part of the book, what I'm trying to do is to say what I've just said in a couple of seconds, but to stretch it to 5,000 minutes. <laughs> um, and that is really what I would like to share with you. And if you have a question or two, I'd be happy uh, to take it. So thank you.
I don't think you're using the mic. Can you hear me now? Um, University of Oxford Press recently dropped a book about Putin. I think they were still in the early developmental stages, um, but because of all the developments in Ukraine, they thought it was a bad business decision to publish the book. Um, that's very uncommon for OUP, and so I was wondering, and it seems like you were encouraged to write this small book and elaborate on your larger project, but um, over the course of your writing career, have you ever experienced pushback on the part of the publisher um, it, writing about uh, certain like, global <coughs> events and it seems to be an ethical responsibility of the publisher to write about these topics, <coughs> disseminate that information to the public. But right, well, I, I have a feeling, if I get your question, and in truth I did not hear all of it, um, I have never experienced, in my experience with publishers, uh, pushback and the sense of a challenge to what it is that I'm writing. If there's an issue of clarity, I love that. Yes, I want that. An issue of a poorly phrased sentence or thought, yes. Push back to your heart's delight. But editorially, substantively, that has never been uh, my experience. I imagine if the, I think you're saying the Oxford Press is doing a, a Putin book, I'm sure a lot of people are. Um, there are different ways of approaching Putin. If, if I, I try to do it small out, and not that you, the Ukraine problem is small, it's a major problem, but it is singular. And if you can grasp that and then go wide and try to bring personalities into your story, you can make it quite interesting. Putin is an interesting personality. Lavrov is interesting. Obama is interesting. Some of the leaders in Ukraine are interesting people. But we don't know all of these people. And I'm a, <clears throat> a strong believer in the power of history to determine today and tomorrow. Ukraine is filled with negative aspects, filled with them. Um, there are people very close to the Ukrainian leadership, as best we know it, who could be defined as fascist. Up until three weeks ago, Putin was saying time and again that the leadership in Ukraine has a bunch of fascists. He was exaggerating it, but there are a few of them there. And they are the people who always believe that their core was to be pure. And if you had a purity of spirit, of religion, of history, of region, you were acceptable. But if you were outside of that narrow circle, you would be considered a foreigner and likely to be attacked. And in the 15th, 16th century, under Cossack leaders, one after another, went after those people on the outside. And there was a lot of bloodshed. And that continued right into the 20th. And I suspect they're still lurking in corners now. Yes, ma'am, right here. I um, just read that book, um, Man Without a Face, about... Yes. Uh, have you read it? Yes. What do you think... My book group, which was the Harvard alumni right. group here, we were questioning... Uh, we felt that she was making a lot of suppositions in that book based on... And what, what was your opinion of that? Well, th this is Masha Gessen's book. Yeah. Uh, Masha Gessen is a, uh, a very impressive... Russian journalist who was now living in New York, and living in New York because if she continued living in Moscow, she probably would be killed, yeah. like a number of others who have been killed. And so she goes <coughs> on both knowledge and instinct. I think you're objecting probably to the well, instinct we I mean, we didn't know. part of it. Yeah. We felt, could she make some of these? Could she make some of these? Um, 
my answer to that is if anyone can, she can. A very impressive uh, journalist and writer, thinker. Um, I'm on her team all the way. What she was able to do in that book is to give a lot of what Putin has allowed out about himself. And she took a great deal and added other stories which a good journalist would normally do. The Upshot is a fascinating book about as close, I think, to an insight into the real Putin as we have at this point. I think myself that he, by making the fuss he's making about Ukraine, <clears throat> is probably shortening his own tenure in office. Um, I think his victory in the Crimea is a shallow victory, probably a Pyrrhic victory, um, with a short-term gain but ultimately a, a loss, because he has opened up many, many camps, and he's not going to be able to take care of all of the problems unleashed. Right, well, thank you very much. For You're very welcome.